Okay, on behalf of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center and the Jacob Hitler Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's webinar. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Heather Blumenthal, and I'm the Executive Director of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. We are very excited to welcome our special guest speaker, Lucy Adlington, who took an English degree from Cambridge University and a Master's in Medieval Studies from the University of York. Lucy is a British dress historian with more than 20 years experience researching social history. She runs History Wardrobe, a company which presents costumes in context talks across the UK. Her non-fiction publications include Women's Lives and Clothes in World War II, Ready for Action, and Stitches in Time, the story of the clothes we wear. Tonight, we are honored to be hosting her South African premiere of the Dressmakers of Auschwitz. At the height of the Holocaust, 25 young inmates of the infamous Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, mainly Jewish women and girls, were selected to design, cut, and sew beautiful fashions for elite Nazi women in a dedicated saloon. It was work that they hoped would spare them from the gas chambers. This fashion workshop called the Upper Tailoring Studio was established by Hedwig Hoss, the camp commandant's wife and patronized by the wives of SS guards and officers. Here the dressmakers produced high quality garments for SS social functions in Auschwitz and for ladies from the Nazi Berlin's Upper Cross. Upper Crust. Drawing on diverse sources, including interviews with the last surviving seamstress, the dressmakers of Auschwitz follows the fates of these brave women. Their bonds of family and friendship not only help them endure persecution, but also to play their part in camp resistance. Weaving the dressmakers' remarkable experiences within the context of Nazi policies for plunder and exploitation. Historian Lucy exposes the greed cruelty and hypocrisy of the Third Reich and offers a, offers a fresh look at a little known chapter of World War II and the Holocaust. Before we begin, a few housekeeping rules. Our team will switch off your cameras and everybody will be muted. We will have a question and answer section at the end of the lecture. So be sure to type your questions either in the chat or the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome Lucy Adlington. Well, hello everyone, and thank you Heather for that lovely introduction. And thank you everybody for joining me. I'm actually speaking to you from a farm in the north of England. We've had a storm recently and there's a very small threat of the power going out. If it does, I will be back with candles and uh, hopefully we'll all be fine. So as Heather has explained, I'm a dress historian, a clothes historian, and I spend a lot of time in the past, a lot of time in other people's lives in the past. And yet, particularly over the last couple of years, our communities have all been living in very difficult times, a lot of change, a lot of unease. And it occurred to me that there was so much that resonated from this particular aspect of history that I've been studying and writing about. And so today I thought I would centre this talk on a couple of themes that are very strong in the book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. I'm looking behind me because some of the dressmakers are right here. So today I wanted to talk about themes of hope and friendship because I have such a strong sense now of how important these are to us all during various lockdowns, during the ease and disruption of the pandemic. We've all felt the increased need for good community and good, good connections. So what a what nicer way to illustrate this and the fact that we can all meet today via Zoom. So the thing, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> I had a cup of tea before I started and it's gone down wrong. Right, well, that's not a brilliant start. So the theme of hope inevitably is balanced with despair. 
So I'm going to start on quite a sombre note, and I'm going to introduce you to one of the young women featured here, if you can see them. This young woman here, woman here is Eraina Reichenberg. And Eraina, as are all these women, is from Slovakia. It's something that struck me when I was first able to discover more of the biographers of the dressmakers from this fashion salon in Auschwitz. I was struck by the fact that most of them were from Slovakia or from Hungary, neighboring countries. So Irina Reichenberg grew up in, on the Jewish street, Judengasse, of Bratislava in Slovakia. It was Czechoslovakia before the Germans partitioned it. And Irina was from a very poor family. Her father was a shoemaker, so very talented, but not a very lucrative trade. And Irina had no thoughts of sewing or being a seamstress until the pro-fascist government in Slovakia told all Jews that they could not run businesses, they could not attend school, they could not train for work, essentially leaving them destitute. And Irina was one of those very young, young people who suddenly thought, what, what would our future be then? And she said, on the spur of the moment, I decided to learn to sew a little. And she, along with her best friend Bracha, and another friend, Renee, took sewing lessons on the underground, on the sly. They were not allowed to learn. And remarkably, it was this skill that helped save Irina's life. She didn't know that. In spring 1942, these women here, along with several thousand others, were on the first official Jewish transports into Auschwitz, into the main camp, along with some other transferred prisoners from Ravensbrück women's camp. They were the first women prisoners in the camp. And these young women in March and April 1942 had been told they were going to work. So Irina might have thought, oh, we'll be doing labor perhaps, or perhaps I'll be sewing, making uniforms, which was very common in the early 1940s. The Germans used forced labor in many textile factories around occupied countries in Europe. But the work Irina was to do was far more brutal. She, along with the other young women, were put to clearing swamps, to working in gravel pits and sand quarries on construction work. And she was even set to build the new gas chambers at the Auschwitz extension camp in Birkenau with her bare hands. The work itself was brutal, their treatment was brutal, the diet was brutal. It's no wonder that Irina worried, how can anyone survive this? And of her many school friends, very few survived to live through summer and into autumn. And then Irina was lucky. She got work indoors in Auschwitz and she got work, work sorting clothes. Now, as you can imagine with all the trains of people arriving at the camp, they're all bringing luggage thinking, oh, we're going to a work camp or we're going to a new ghetto perhaps, they didn't know. And so they packed all their best clothes, their favorite clothes, perhaps their work tools and their sewing kits, anything that they thought they might need that would fit in one suitcase. Now these young women had already had their belongings stolen from them and this is what would happen to all deportees in the concentration camps and extermination centers. And the belongings were put into vast warehouses. In Canada, there are about 35 warehouses for sorting plunder and this is all relevant to our bit of history here. And Irina was one of those clambering on mountains of stolen goods, pulling at the clothes, and some prisoners were set to look for valuables. So they looked in the padded shoulders, had people hidden money or jewels. Bracha even found valuables hidden behind the buttons of clothing. She searched in the pockets, they were all to look everywhere for valuables. In fact, one time, this is Bracha here, Bracha Berkovich. This is Irina's best friend. Bracha put her hand in one coat and pulled something out, uh, plums, she thought, and she popped them in her mouth to eat them, and they were not plums. They were her first taste of olives because the clothes were of murdered deportees from Greece, 
from transports that had been brought in. So the women are pulling at the clothes and sorting them into piles and bundling them up to send back into Greater Germany, into the Reich rather. And here, all of these stolen clothes were given to civilians. But the clothes from Jewish deportees that would have had the yellow star sewn on by law, those stars were unpicked. Although some prisoners said they did their best when they had to unpick the yellow stars to leave little fragments of thread. So perhaps the civilians who received these stolen clothes might wonder, where had the clothes come from? But on the whole, they just had to work in these vast warehouses called Canada, meaning a land of plenty. And as Irina here was sorting through clothes, she came across clothes belonging to her sister, Frida. And Frida had been deported to Auschwitz with her young baby and murdered. And finding Frida's clothes was evidence of that murder. Inevitably, Irina was distraught. And this happened to so many prisoners working in the warehouses. Add to that, that two other sisters who were with Irina in the barracks, uh, this would be in Birkenau by late summer and autumn 1942, one of them succumbed to typhus and died. And that was Yoli. And then her sister Edith was selected for the gas, for death. Both young women, both would have been healthy and fine if they hadn't been deported to Auschwitz for being Jewish. And so at a point in 1942, Ava was absolutely saturated with despair. She wanted to kill herself. She didn't see how anyone could survive. And she said to her friend Bracker, the only way out is through the chimneys. So there's despair. But Bracha was an optimist. She'd grown up in a rural part of Slovakia. She was used to hard work. Her father was a tailor, a very talented tailor, who had passed on his tailoring skills to Bracha's sister, Katka. And Bracha said to Irina, you are not going to kill yourself. She said, we are going to get out of here. We are going back to Bratislava. We are going to have coffee and cake on the Corso. And Irina said, no, no, you cannot survive this. And you can understand why Irina would feel this way. The conditions in Birkenau were truly appalling. Nobody could survive, she thought. But this optimism of Bracha was very important and the friendship that bonded them together. So every day, Bracha dragged Irina from the bunks into the warehouses to work. And this optimism of Bracha kept Irina alive for a while. And then in the warehouses, they made another connection. This young woman here came in. This is Marta. And Marta was 25 years old when she was deported to Auschwitz. She was a very talented dressmaker, a cutter. So a cutter essentially turns the two dimensions of a pattern, she can create the pattern, into the three dimensions of a garment. They're able to, to form the, the pieces of the pattern. And my grandmother was a very talented dressmaker. In fact, here's our family sewing machine. And she could just draw patterns on newspaper just from in her head. She could see a garment and think, ah, oh, that needs to be like this. Now, in 1942, when these young women were taken to Auschwitz, Germany was on a war economy and had been for many years. They'd been putting all resources into military projects, military industrialization, and resources are very scarce. So in this dressmaking pattern from a National Socialist fashion magazine, there is only one sheet of paper. It's printed on both sides, it's tissue paper, and there are about 20 garments. All the different pieces from these 20 garments overlaid onto one sheet of paper. So a cutter, a dressmaker, a tailor would need immense skills to transform this into a garment. So such were Marta's skills. 
And Marta had been on the second transport of Jewish women into Auschwitz in March 1942. And somehow she had the luck, and it was a very mixed luck, to be selected to work at the Commandant's house. The Commandant of Auschwitz was Rudolf Huss, and he'd started out in Dachau, and then moved to Sachsenhausen, and then to Auschwitz. And all the time, his views aligned completely with National Socialist views, and they aligned completely with the misguided Nazi notions of racial supremacy, and they aligned completely with anti-Semitic views. He saw Jewish people as subhuman, as not people. His wife Hedvig, and they, they married in the 1920s, they were both very young, her views aligned with his. So all the way along, she was comfortable to support him and to support his work at concentration camps. Perhaps at first she didn't know the full extent of the atrocities of mass murder, of genocide. But Hedwig and Rudolf lived in a beautiful house right on the edge of the Auschwitz main camp. They called it paradise. They had prisoner labor to create a, a garden, gorgeous garden, just think of roses and a swimming pool and a pergola and bees buzzing around the flowers and new trees coming up to hide the view of the camp. You can see the camp rooftops from this garden. And Hedvig wanted help in the house. And so at first she used Jehovah's Witnesses, prisoners who were considered very honest. But then when she heard that these young women had been brought into Auschwitz, she decided she would take advantage of their labor. So this story is very much one of abuse of privilege and choices. Hedwig chose to be part of the regime that created the concentration camps in Europe and that ran them and that profited from them. And Hedwig liked the plunder warehouses because to her, they just represented a vast shopping experience, but no need to pay. At least she only paid morally, but she didn't even know that. So she would send prisoners into the warehouses to pick out things she would like. And one of the prisoners then who came to work for Hedvig Huss was Marta, the talented dressmaker. And Marta at one point volunteered when Hedvig said she needed help remodeling a fur coat. She said, I can do that. And this was not because Marta wanted to work for the Nazis, that she wanted to be friends with Hedvig. It was absolutely a matter of survival. To have a good work position in a concentration camp is literally the difference between life and death. And so Marta's sewing skills now became her opportunity to live a little bit longer. And she sewed in Hedvig's house up in the attic, overlooking the main camp. And she used her relative privilege there. She did not abuse it, she used it to save other lives, to pluck people from Auschwitz-Birkenau. So an older woman came to join her, and then a 14-year-old girl. And eventually she was able to recommend, oh, Frau Huss, you could have a, a woman to come and knit cardigans and jumpers for your family. And there was another life saved. Oh, oh Frau Huss, you could have someone to come and do your hair. I know a hairdresser. And in this way, Marta was able to save lives, even as Rudolf and Hedwig Huss were profiteering from murdered lives. So what a contrast. So imagine Marta sewing. Where did she get all the fabrics and sewing notions from? From the plunder of murdered Jewish people, from plundered shops in occupied Poland, all brought to Auschwitz to be sorted. So one day, as Bracha and her sister Katka and Irina were enduring, were keeping going in a plunder warehouse in the main camp, Marta came in. Marta came in looking for fabrics to make things, not only for Hedvig Huss, but the other SS wives in the camp had grown jealous of the beautiful fashions that Hedvig's family had. And so Hedvig established a fashion salon in Auschwitz. 
Now, I mentioned already that there were forced labor factories in ghettos and in camps. There were thousands of such factories abusing labor, giving Jewish people the opportunity for another day to live in return for them, sewing Wehrmacht uniforms and SS uniforms and even civilian clothes. But this was different. Many of the SS staff in Auschwitz did have their own pet seamstress or tailor or shoemaker. In fact, it's one reason that Irene, Irene's uh, father survived. He was in a camp in Slovakia, but he was such a good shoemaker that the camp guards used him to cobble for them and to make, to make footwear. So in Auschwitz, there were tailors and seamstresses who were adopted, if you will, as a sort of pet tailor or seamstress for an SS guard, an SS staff member. But Hedwig went so much further. And to my knowledge, this is the only fashion salon, fashion salon, not uniforms, not mass production, but couture fashion salon in a concentration camp. And it's the most grotesque contrast ever, isn't it? How could it be possible? And here in this salon, Marta was put as capo, as the, the head worker of the sewing commando, of the fashion commando making clothes for Hedwig and her family, making clothes for other SS wives, and on the side, making clothes for the SS guard who oversaw the salon, and a woman called Elizabeth Rupert. So Marta saw that Irina was working in the plunder warehouse. She saw that Irina was close to death. She was absolutely in despair, and Marta gave her hope. Because Marta used the upper tailoring salon, this fashion salon, as a haven. As she had done while working in the Huss Villa, Marta was able to bring young women into the salon and save their lives for a little bit longer at least. So she was able to have Irina come and join her. And once Irina got in the salon, she said, oh, my best friend Bracha, she's, she's good at sewing. And eventually Bracha was saved from the hell of Birkenau and hard labor. And she came to the salon and Bracha then said, oh, my sister Katka, she is a great tailor. You must get her in to make coats. And they had all manner of specialists, mainly Jewish women and mainly Slovakian, because here's where the friendship comes in. As Bracha herself said, she said there were hundreds, there were thousands of seamstresses in Auschwitz-Birkenau, some of them who'd worked in Paris. And in fact, I was able to find out about one who'd worked for Coco Chanel before she was deported. But as Bracha said, if you didn't have any connections, you didn't have any luck. So that network of connections, of friendship was crucial. And I've been very heartened, particularly studying this aspect of history, are just how strong female friendships were in the camps, where possible. Whereas Rudolf Huss and the other SS men were trying to destroy family connections, destroy lives, destroy humanity, these young women resisted by keeping their humanity, by keeping those strong connections. And there was a core eventually of 25 young women working in this salon, working in relative comfort as in they were allowed normal clothes, they were allowed to keep clean, and they were not beaten and brutalized, and they did not have to stand for hours outdoors for roll call, which killed so many prisoners. Ultimately, I think about 40 women passed through the upper tailoring salon, which might not seem like much when over a million are murdered in Auschwitz, but it is something, each life saved is so precious and my research is ongoing, we may find more. So here in this salon then, there is a hub of Jewish women making beautiful clothes for Nazi women. Now these are the same Nazi women who have been part of a regime that wanted to declare Germany Judenfrei, Jew free, that wanted to declare Europe Jew free. In fact, the whole world, that was the mission. So you're probably thinking, how on earth do you get a fashion salon and Nazi clients? Well, I, I hope if you read the book, you'll be able to see the full explanation of the, the motives behind this. 
But I think they're really powerful. It's really important to consider that one of the big motivators for the expansion of the Third Reich, it's greed, it's plunder. And you see it on a huge scale in Auschwitz and other extermination camps and concentration camps. You see it in the ghetto. You see it on individual levels of people plundering individual businesses and homes. It is absolutely endemic. And this plunder finances the German military. And this plunder also enriches the material lives of the SS. So there are so many examples I could tell you of SS benefiting from Jewish skills, Jewish labor, knowing full well it's Jewish and publicly saying, oh, I won't go near any Jews and using all of that hateful propaganda. But meanwhile, they have Jewish cobblers, Jewish dressmakers, all manner of forced labor. So even in the upper tailoring sal salon run by Marta, there was an order book for, and I quote, the very highest names in Berlin. So SS in Berlin were ordering fashions from Auschwitz. And you can bet your life they did not have a label on saying made by Jewish hands. So to see how, how there is this journey to a fashion salon in Auschwitz, to Jewish seamstresses clothing elite Nazi women. I want to take you back a little in time to 1930s Germany. And I'll introduce you now to this young woman who's hiding just behind my chair. Can you see? This is, this is Hunya, Hunya Volkman. Hunya was also from Slovakia, from a town called Keshmarok. And Hunya moved to Germany in the 1930s, and here she is in 1934, around the time of her marriage. And Hunya was another really talented dressmaker. She dressed the elite of Leipzig, and I mean Jews and non-Jews. So all the clients wanted Hunya's creations. So Hunya was very well aware of the danger of the National Socialist Movement. And she was a living witness to the gradual erosion of rights of Jewish people. In fact, the stripping of their citizenship, the theft of their businesses, of their homes, their deportations. And in 1930s Germany, the state, the government, were very much on board with businesses to plunder Jewish businesses as much as possible. So, in, in a sense, it was legal to steal whatever you wanted from the Jews. It was not considered theft. And I'm going to show you a garment now that's from my collection. I collect originals and antiques. And I'm, as a dress historian, of course, I think that clothes tell stories and clothes hold memories. And they might tell us a lot about the culture, the technology of the times, the politics even. They can tell us so much. And the dress I'm going to show you, you might be excused for thinking, it's just a nice dress. So I hope you can get a sense of it here. So this is a very pretty apple green gown. And it dates to the late 1930s, the styling is very typical. It's of a light floral crepe fabric. And a few clues will tell us that Germany at this time is really struggling economically. So hence the need for plunder and theft. The design is very thrifty. So no fabric is wasted. It has very narrow seams and just a rolled hem and very modest very skimpy embellishments. So this is not a luxurious dress. This is not a dress of conspicuous consumption. It's not the sort of thing that Magda Goebbels or Emmy Goering might wear, made by Jewish women often, or appropriated from Jewish plunder. This is a dress for an ordinary woman in Germany. And it raises lots of questions about the involvement of ordinary people and discrimination and anti-Semitism, because this dress is absolutely saturated with anti-Semitism. How do we know? Look at the label. 
I hope you can see. The label reads ADEFA, A-D-E-F-A. ADEFA are an organization set up just weeks after Hitler comes to power. They're an organization of national socialist businessmen who are very closely aligned with Hitler's new regime. And they are an organization dedicated to eliminating Jews from the textile and garment trade. You might be excused for thinking, ah, fashion, textiles, so what? And yet textiles are a huge part of many countries' economies. They still are. And fashion is a huge part of many countries' revenue, both the design talent and the making of fashion. So in the 1930s in Germany, Jewish capital and Jewish talent dominate the textile trade because they're just so good at it. They have very long established businesses and these might be weaving factories to actually create the yarns and garments. They might be design workshops. They might be the actual technicians, the people who make the clothes and embellishment. But then also think of the grand department stores. The majority of these are Jewish owned. It's their innovation and their vision that created these department stores. And then also smaller boutiques, the local tailors, the local haberdashers, the local milliners, run by very experienced Jewish people. And then of course at home, sewing is a very typical domestic skill for women in particular, making and mending your own clothes. So ADEFA, this federation of German businessmen, they want to eliminate their Jewish rivals. And they're not going to do it by producing better products, by fair business practices. They do it through propaganda and theft and bullying. Essentially, ADEFA is for Deutsch Arische, German Aryans. Aryan meaning non-Jewish, this, this Nazi construct of some mythical, mythical superhumanity that is not Jewish. So ADEFA advertised their clothes as being made by German hands only, and by German they meant Aryan, not Jewish. Yeah. And then they also exhorted consumers to buy from ADEFA because it's not made by Jews. And it wasn't just a defo. I'm going to show you now from my archive. I love collecting original garments and original documents. This is something that looks very innocent. It's a 1930s booklet of knitting yarns. So knitting and crochet yarns, very popular, different colors, uh, different samples. You can even at the back, there are military colors quite a, a sinister development. And this knitting booklet comes from the largest knitting yarn manufacturer in German, Germany, Quell. And it actually states inside, made by only Aryan production, purely Aryan production. So that emphasis on Aryan only raised all sorts of interesting choices for consumers. Are you going to rush and buy a defa clothes because Jews didn't make them? Are you going to resist Nazi boycotts and the bullying brown shirts standing outside shops saying, don't buy from Jews? And are you going to go in? So there's little decisions. They may seem nothing. They may seem trivial, what you wear, who makes it, but they're not. They're all part of this wider political narrative and very dangerous because a defa with the backing of the, of the National Socialist Party, they succeed in their aim. By the time they disband at the start of the Second World War, they consider job done because there are no Jews left in the fashion trade. That is not strictly true. The Jews are there, but they're working in secret, still adopted by high-ranking Nazis, or they've been moved to occupy Poland, for example, and they're working in forced labor factories, creating clothes with no labels on to say they're made by Jews. So I hope that dress gives you an idea of why, why I think clothing can be so powerful 
at looking at economics, looking at politics, looking at culture in the past, and also creating a sense of connection for us. You know, we might think, well, what would my choices be? Even now we might wonder about the clothes we wear and, and who made them. So there's 1930s Germany, that beautiful dress. And as I mentioned before, Hunja, Hunja Volkmann, the dressmaker is in Leipzig and she experiences the, the fear and horror of Kristallnacht. And she appreciates that Germany is not safe for Jews, but she cannot get out. Where would she go that would be safe? And of course, wherever possible, these young women have been trying to find visas to get to Shanghai in China, to make it to Portugal and perhaps to South America, to get to South Africa even, anywhere that seems safe. It's not possible. And so they're, they're trapped in Europe. Hunya herself is deported in 1943. So she comes a little later than the rest. And this brings me back to the idea of hope again. If you recall, young Bracha told her friend Eraina to have hope. We're going to get out, she said. And Hunya was another one of those forces of optimism. She, uh, she was a very formidable character. She worked for the underground while she was in Auschwitz. And she joined Marta eventually in the upper tailoring salon. And Marta by this stage had ensured that the upper tailoring salon was a hub of resistance. And you can read, I mean, it's just remarkable, isn't it? It, it is so encouraging to hear these stories of resistance. And so often people have characterized prisoners as being passive, like lambs to the slaughter, people say, that's the phrase. I think when you read this book, you'll get some sense of not only the big gestures of, of revolt in Auschwitz, but also the many, many daily small acts of kindness that can mean the difference between life and death, between feeling human or feeling that you are the vermin that the SS say you are. And so these women definitely played their part in that. And you can hear about the, the messages smuggled in and out of Auschwitz. You can hear about escape attempts and Marta's work with the communist underground in Auschwitz. And all the time while sewing for the enemy. Extraordinary. So Hunya arrives in 1943 and she's traveling with a friend called Ruth on the last transport out of Leipzig, the last transport of Jews. And as the doors slide open and they arrive at the station at Auschwitz, at this time it's not, not within Birkenau, and as they're about to step down and the men and women are about to be separated, Hunya's friend Ruth, Ruth's husband, turns to Ruth and says to her, stick with Hunya, I have a feeling she'll make it. Well, unfortunately, Ruth and Hunya are separated and Ruth is not a seamstress. So she doesn't get saved by Marta's fashion salon. But Marta does manage to save Hunya, who uh, is very close to death when her number's called to work in the salon. And you can read examples of how defiant Hunya is, even giving back chat to SS guards right from the start. In fact, right from the very first moments of dehumanization when the women have their clothes taken. So if you ever thought that clothes are inconsequential, think how you'd like to have them stolen from you, how you'd like to have them ripped from you by screaming guards in public, how it would feel to have all your familiar clothes, everything gone, your underwear, everything, and then goes your hair and then they take your name. But even during that very deliberate process of dehumanization, the Nazis did not need to take people's clothes. They did not need to give them disgraceful rags or old Russian uniforms in the case of the Slovakian women arriving in 1942 or the humiliating strike prison guard. They didn't need to do that. They could have left them with their own clothes, but they knew that naked people find it hard to resist. It demoralizes you. It takes your dignity, takes your humanity in some way. So for a woman such as Hunya arriving to that process, as did all the new arrivals in Auschwitz, how she managed to keep her dignity 
what she did. She said, you're not having my boots. I need these boots for work. She wanted to hold on to them. So she kept that spirit of defiance with her. But perhaps optimism wasn't enough and friendship wasn't enough. You also needed luck. And so many of those, those few who survived, and it is only a few, isn't it, from how many entered the camp system and were brutalized, so few survive. It's consistent that they say they have luck. And Hunya, who did survive, she was asked, how come you survived? And she said, luck, sewing skills, and a good capo. So she paid tribute to the fact that her sewing saved her life and the fact that she had a capo who used her influence for good and to create this amazing network of, of women and this amazing hub of resistance. But luck, luck didn't hold for everybody. And I can tell you that not all the dressmakers did survive. And one of those who sadly was shot was a very dynamic woman called Lulu, also a Slovakian. And Lulu was very mischievous. And there was one scene that Hunya talked about in the dressmaking salon. And you should imagine, by the way, how it would feel for these women sitting in a fashion salon sewing for the SS. And I've, I've got here a 1940s dressmaking mannequin, very reassuring round tummy. And I think how intimate it is for a dressmaker and a client. And it was Marta who did most of the fittings. So Marta, who was most intimate with the SS women who'd come in. And you've to imagine the SS women browsing magazines such as this one. This is Die Mode, fashion magazine uh, in German. And it's very much a national socialist ethos within. And they would browse magazines such as this selecting fashions, seeing which styles would be popular. And another popular one is Die Dame, Lady Magazine, the oldest running, one of the oldest running fashion magazines in Germany. These two editions, by the way, are the last ever editions of each magazine because the Germans ran out of paper. And so they did not print subsequent fashion magazines. And Quite eerily, these, uh, these magazines, I bought them, they're from Krakow in Poland. So that would have been occupied Poland. And you can't help wondering who was browsing them back in the war, who had these in Krakow. So you imagine the clients in the upper tailoring salon browsing through these magazines and then having the dresses fitted. And remember, this is all fabric that's been taken from the plunder warehouses. And if I show you this tape measure, this is relevant to my story. The brand there is Faf. So Faf and Singer and Frister, these were all um, sewing notions and machines that were used in the upper tailoring salon. But ironically, this is my grandmother's sewing, sewing tape measure. You know, and I never registered until I started writing this book that she had a Faf, Faf um, tape measure and it wasn't because she, was, uh, she wasn't associated with the Nazis. She was very anti-Nazi, very anti-fascist. But it was just that Germany was such a big producer of textiles and sewing notions. Anyway, back to Lulu before I wrap up. I'll give you just a couple more minutes. I could talk for a very long time about these women. Lulu Grunberg was very mischievous and very spirited. And one time when Hedwig Huss the commandant's wife, had come to be fitted by Marta. She, Hedwig had left her youngest boy, Hans Jürgen, in the dressmaking workshop in the main sewing room. Now, Marta already knew the, the Huss children because she'd worked at the villa and the Huss children had played with her. It's just so surreal, isn't it, that these enforced laborers, enslaved laborers, are not considered fit to live but that they looked after the Huss children. They made the Huss clothes. Horrible disconnect. So anyway, Lulu was sewing in the main sewing room. Little Hans Jürgen was left out there to play. And Lulu, she, something must have snapped with her. And you can understand, because even though these women were relatively protected in the salon, they knew 
they knew everything that was happening. And this would have been around the time that the camp was being expanded in order to murder Jews from Hungary. It was uh, something that Marta was very keen to escape and tell the world about the Hungarian, the plans for Hungarian Jews. As it happened, Marta's friends, Rudolf Ferber and Freddy Wetzler got out safely. She was next to go if they hadn't made it to warn the world about the proposed genocide of Hungarian Jews. So Lulu, something snaps with her in the workshop and she suddenly leaps up. She's got a tape measure in her hand and she wraps it around the little boy's neck. And she says, soon you are all going to hang. You, your mother, your father, all of you. And then she carries on sewing. And the next day, Hedvig Huss came to the salon. She said, you know, I don't understand it. The little boy doesn't want to come. So just, that's just one example of the interactions there. And there are more examples where, you know, Hedvig talks to, to Marta and said, you know, I, I had no idea that Jewesses could work. She said, I thought you sat around in cafes talking. So I hope, I hope people have the opportunity to read the book and read more of these histories of these, these remarkable women, these resilient women, the women who balanced hope and despair. And you will be glad to know that thanks to Marta's care and thanks to their sewing skills, thanks to their friendship, many of the women did live to see liberation. And one of the first things they did upon returning home, obviously they're looking for family members, if any have survived, which all too sadly were not many. But after that, they had to find work. And that meant sewing. It meant finding a sewing machine. And so I'm going to end by showing you a garment made by one of the dressmakers. And of all the things I have in my collection, and they include gowns by Dior, they include 18th century embroidery. They're lovely, but this is my favorite. This was a gift from Hunya's niece, Gila. And it's a silky two-piece suit from the 1950s. Hunya was lucky to find shelter in the British Mandate of Palestine, which of course becomes the independent state of Israel. And Hunya had an apartment in Tel Aviv. I went to visit the apartment and to, to speak with various family members of and relatives of survivors. And Hunya hosted reunions for the dressmakers at this, this apartment, but she also sewed. She sewed for some of the very elegant ladies' boutiques in Tel Aviv but she sewed for her family. And she turned one of her dresses, this, into a suit for her young teenage niece, Gila. And so when Gila donated this to me, when she passed it on to the collection, I couldn't help thinking, yes, clothes tell stories, don't they? And they hold memories. And we don't always know the stories. They don't always have labels. There's no label in here to say made by Hunya. There's no label in here to say this was stitched by a woman who survived Auschwitz in a fashion salon. But I know that Hunya made this with love for Gila. And in return, as Hunya sat sewing, Gila wrote down Hunya's stories. She crafted a memoir. And so, this garment, other garments, other documents, other memoirs, these have all formed research for my book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. And they include some video testimonies with surviving seamstresses, chatting with the family, you know, hearing how the second generation coped. And also I had the great good fortune to be able to fly to America and speak to the last surviving seamstress of Auschwitz. I'm not gonna tell you which one it is. You have to read the book to find out. But she really, she really opened my eyes to so much that you can't learn from documents, from garments, to be able to hear her memories, to ask her questions. And since I've said this is a talk about hope and friendship, I'm going to end on a light note. The book has been incredibly harrowing to research and write, all the more harrowing for knowing that every word of it is true. And I felt immense gratitude that I have not had to endure any of this, even when 
you know, and during lockdowns, even when worrying about the pandemic, I've still thought, you know, I have not had to endure what these young women and what countless others endured. And so to end on something of a lighter note, I'll end with the last surviving seamstress of Auschwitz who said, I was 1000 days in Auschwitz and on each of those days, I could have died a thousand times, but I lived and she did live. She lived to tell her story. And now this story is shared. It's shared so widely. I'm, I cannot tell you how extraordinary it is for me. You know, I've been involved in this project so intensely for so many years and then to realize, oh, other people want to read about it. Um, since the book came out in the States, it's been on the New York Times bestseller list, which is phenomenal. And I'm just hearing from so many people around the world who say, oh, my mother was a dressmaker, my father was a tailor. And so the sharing of these stories, these connections, it continues and it continues to bind us all. So where the Nazis sought to divide and create us and them, this history, even the, pa the past, can connect us now. And just as a very, very light-hearted finish, my last garment. A swimming costume. You did not expect that, did you? Well, I brought the swimming costume as a little bit of a nod to Hunya because she had to retrain to make factory clothes. The work of boutiques and elegant ladies salons was changing in the 1960s. And so Hunya retrained in mass production and she worked for an Israeli company uh, headed by Leah Gottlieb. It's Gottlieb's leisure wear. Now, I don't know who made this swing costume. I don't know if Hunya did. There were hundreds of people sewing. But I've, I've brought it out at the end of my presentations just to say, you know, we can all spare a thought for the invisible people in our lives and spare a thought for perhaps those who've made the clothes we're wearing, who will never get a chance to meet and think, you know, what are their work lives like? Are they in sweated conditions? Are they getting a fair wage? And not to feel guilty about clothes, but really to appreciate them. And if you have knitters or seamstresses or tailors, in, in your family, to spare a bit of appreciation for the work and love that goes into the things they make. My grandmother made so many clothes for me when I was little. And you know, I never thought to say thank you. So in a way, this book is a thank you to my grandmother. It's a thank you to the families who've shared their family histories. And it's a very big thank you to these extraordinary women for showing us how you can retain humanity, even in the most degrading of circumstances. And now I end by thanking you for joining me and for listening and thanking my wonderful, wonderful host for this opportunity to speak today. And I may have overstepped my mark here. <laughs> I've gone on a little bit, but I do still have, I have lots of time for questions and anybody who wants to get in touch with me can do so via my website. Thank you kindly. Well, well, I must tell you, Lucy, that I read your book and I couldn't put it down. And I was amazed how you were able to weave the reality of what happened in the early 30s um, and what happened in, um, in Auschwitz and, and how you were able to take the stories of these women and, and allow them to be our friends, while one was reading, you, you brought them to life um, under circumstances that were very difficult and, and very hard. Um, it really was, I think, a labor of love. I know that you, um, that you love history and, and fashion, but really it, it, it truly is a remarkable book. And, and for all of you who are watching, I really feel that it's something that, um, that you, should, you should read. Um, so we have some thank yous um, from Beryl for Glynn. Thank you for an amazing webinar. Um, Bertha wants to ask a question. Um, so we've asked her to put it in the chat. 
Um, Myrna Rez says, thank you for a fascinating talk. Sarah Cohen, thank you, Lucy, for a fascinating story and the special memories you shared. Um, from Erica, thank you so much. This was inspiring. I would like to get a copy, presumably on the usual platforms. So it is, it's, uh, it's on most of the platforms. It's at Exclusive Books as well. It's also available at the Gitlin Library. Um, and there are, you can get it online as a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Lucy, help me here. <laughs> I don't know. You can get it online, that's for sure. You can get it online. You can get it online as a Kindle. It's oh, a Kindle, Kindle yes. It is on audio, and I narrated the audio book, which was a, wow. a very harrowing experience in its own way. It really brings it home to you when you're reading aloud. And if anybody is, um, I'm going to just foolishly volunteer this. I have book plates. If anybody would like me to send a signed book plate, if, if you're gifting the book, um, I know some people have been gifting it to family members with, with connections to the story. So, you know, you just email me and I'll send a, a signed book plate if you wish. But yes, there are so many ways to engage with history now. And yes, I did write the book with love, Heather, but I also wrote it in what one reviewer has called a cold fury. So yes, lots of emotions. Well, it is, a, look, it's an emotional topic and it's yeah, an emotional it subject. Be. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was just remarkable that you were able to find these amazing women and to tell their stories. Serendipity. How long did it take you to research and write the book? I've been answering that question with 30 years and one year. I've been interested in fragments of writing, you know, that the, the fragments of writing that, that people who were being deported would toss from trains, you know, postcards and notes, or hide in the slats of the, the cattle wagons, or fragments of diaries that Zonda Commando buried you know, outside the crematoria. You know, all these little fragments of words interested me as a student where I was supposed to be studying grand Greek tragedies and Shakespeare and iambic pentameter. And actually what I wanted to do was to, to, to read what I thought were the real tragedies of people desperately trying to communicate. So for 30 years, I've been collecting information and I have written a, a fair bit about women at war, you know, around the world. And that's where I first came across mention of the fashion salon, which nobody had written about. And serendipity meant that I could turn just a few clues into archival research. And now I, I feel blessed that all of this, this work is, is reaching so many people. Um, I should tell you, by the way, there are going to be, to date, 19 translations. So it will be in many different languages. Uh, I saw there's a question just came up about um, about will it be available just in English? No, it is. It's going to be available in my goodness, so many languages, including Slovakia, which I feel is wonderful to honor the original dressmakers. Okay, so Etty said, "Thank you for your research and your storytelling from Ida Pay. Thank you. It was so interesting. Look at looking forward to reading the book." Um, well, from Montreal, Canada, thank you. Oh, um, I should say my son lives in Montreal. Okay, thank you so much for, uh, so thank you so much, looking forward to reading it. Um, Ebook, Kindle, thank you for the work and literally telling us into the, and literally taking us into the wardrobe and of, of an aspect of life. Thank you, Lucy, for your fascinating story. And that even after 75 years, new stories still come out. It um, is extraordinary, and isn't it? That there is always there is always more to know. And I think the interest that readers have, whether it's a personal interest or general human interest, it's still very, very strong. You know, we, and there are always more stories being told from people who haven't felt able to talk or from second generation discovering stories. May I ask Heather, are there any more questions I could answer? It's very kind of you to put them in. Thank you. I think, that, that, I think that people are quite overwhelmed by the story yeah. because it is a very unique story. Um, yeah. It's a true story. You know, our, our, a lot of the, the viewers who come um, to the centre, our friends of the centre, 
um, have listened to many talks about the Holocaust. And I can tell you that this was really something unique and something very special. And I'm so pleased that we were able to bring it to everybody. So it really is compliments. Thank you, Lucy, for sharing your passion, knowledge, and those beautiful stories. Enjoyed and learned from your amazing talk and presentation. Denise, well, thank, thank you for this you. most enlightening insight and so well delivered. Thank you, Lucy, for the effort, research, and time that you've, that you've invested in your story and in allowing us to know even more about um, of our history of the Holocaust. Um, Tell Mrs. Rooney that your work will be translated into Hebrew. Oh, I, I really hope it will. That's one we're still working on um, to, to arrange the contract for Hebrew. I think that would be incredibly powerful. And I'm hoping next year to do a talk with Classrooms Without Borders and, and link up um, and do something directly linking with survivors in Israel, the relatives of survivors rather in Israel. But yes, fingers crossed for a Hebrew translation. Well, I think that's something that has to be done. I'm sure it will be. Um, they, Dimitri, can you just put um, Lucy's website on again? What Lucy had mentioned to me is that if anybody has any kind of garments um, or objects or um, anything special from that period of time, which they would like to discuss with her, to please contact her on her website. You'll be able to find her contact. Yeah, if you have there. any research, anything, you know, perhaps if people have relatives who are working in textiles and want perhaps to know a little bit more about, you know, what that might have been like for them, or, you know, if there's anything I can help with in that way, um, or any stories that people want to share, it would be my pleasure to, to try and help. Okay, and so it, it, thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much. Um, here's a question. Thank you, Lucy, for this deeply moving presentation. What is your next project? My next project, you know, I'm not actually started. This is a unique time in my life when I haven't immediately started writing something else. I've spent so long coming to this point. I've written so many books, you know, and I, I'm so used to being published, but this this has absorbed me so completely that I think I'm, I'm going to continue with research. I think there's still more to know and more connections coming in all the time. And I would be very interested if it were possible to, to write in a way to bring this to a documentary or to bring this to you know, a really good dramatization to reach a wider audience. I think it could be incredibly powerful to use the women's words themselves and their, their anecdotes, their experiences. Um, but I'm also, I, you know, I'm speaking to so many people around the world and there hasn't been time to write anything else because I have the great good fortune now to speak with so many scholars and educators and, and wonderful audiences such as yourselves. And so I'm thinking, you know, right now I am, I feel it's my responsibility to do as much as I can to, to honor these, these women and their history and, um, to, to present their history to as many people as possible. And as you can probably tell, I'm very uncomfortable with all the, the compliments. To my mind, this has been, um, you know, the most important project I've ever worked on. And I, I, wish it, I wish it hadn't happened, as in I wish I couldn't have written this book because there was no history to write about. It, they, these women should not have suffered as they did. Nobody should have done. So, so yes, what I'm going to do now is, is carry on talking and carry on engaging with people. And then I know there will be a story, something will catch me, some garments, some biography, and I will dive back in and write another book. Okay, Philip, would you like to say thank you to Lucy? Philip? He's probably put the kettle on, Heather, you know. Hello, I'm just coming, coming back, back on. Thank you. <laughs> you see, obviously, I need to say thank you very much to you. But before I do that, I'd also like to say thank you very much to Heather uh, and to Jackie Rogers, who is the head librarian at the Gifford Library, for making this all happen. It wouldn't have happened with all those connections, getting back to you and having you here. And the other people I'd like to thank very much is that the Gifford Library has a very, very good section of books, literature, and other material on the Holocaust, thanks to the Morberger Foundation, which over many years has funded this particular area of research. So 
A big thank you to the chair, Dami Yach, and the trustees for supporting this particular area of concern to all of us. And seeing it as Hanukkah, and we're talking about miracles, I think the miracle of survival is something that should be innermost in our minds. And as you put the miracle of hope and friendship that made things possible. So thank you to everyone for being here this evening. And thank you for the people in Cape Town and around the world who are showing an interest in what you are able to say and the stories you are able to tell us through something material culture and weaving it in and bring the personal into the material. So thank you again, Lucy. And to anyone who wants to be in touch with you, it's very easy because just to remember your name as the author of the Dressmakers of Auschwitz and to add .com and they will find you. So thank you all for being with us this evening. And thank you, Lucy, in particular, for the wonderful story you're able to make so real and so special. Thank so with you, that, you, right. So we'll keep in touch. And if everybody wants to read the book, it is certainly available to get to the library. And we look forward to many more webinars and speaking to people about books and other issues around the Holocaust and other subjects as well. Thank you again and good night to all. And Hanukkah Sameach. Thank you. Thank you. You're on mute, uh, Heather. The last words must go to you as a lady, but we do <laughs> need to hear you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Philip. Um, and Lucy, I'm sure we'll be in touch. We will send you a recording of the, um, of the show. Well, Heather, you have all been, you're a wonderful team, a wonderful collaboration. So thank you kindly to everybody for your time and trouble. And I wish you good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Over and out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to everybody.